Our text this morning is one you know really well, Philippians, the fourth chapter, the 12th through the 13th verse. Philippians, the fourth chapter, the 12th through the 13th verses. When you have found it, we ask that you would stand so that I can read it. We're going to read this twice. I'm going to read it once, and I'm going to ask you all to join me in reading it the second time. So I'm going to start now, Philippians 4, 12 through 13. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Won't you uh, read it with me? And this is the NIV version in the uh, monitors, and you can read either. They mean the same thing. I know what it is to have little. Would you read it with me? I know, I know what it is to have much. little. And I know. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. God's word for God's people. You may be seated. I know that you are all noticing finally the season is changing right before our eyes. Let's praise God for a changing season. Thank you, Jesus. Despite everything we've gone through, the 10 feet snow mounds, the tight ice pack lanes that we've learned to navigate, the ridiculously high utility bills. I got a utility bill the other day. I, it was a mortgage payment, I'm telling you. In many moments you thought this weather was never going to end. It looks like winter is ending and we are headed toward another season. I heard on the news the other day that all the snow probably will not go away before the middle of April because it's packed so tight that it will not be melting as quickly as we want it to melt, but we know that the new season is, is on the way. And as always, there is a spiritual lesson here because God works in seasons. God created winter, spring, summer, and fall for very specific and divine reasons. Now, we all think we understand time. If I ask anybody here right now, to tell me what time it is. You look at your watches, you pull out your phone, and you tell me. But in fact, what we don't recall or remember is that time as we know it is manufactured. That's what daylight savings is all about. They set up a time to, to, to make it easier for farmers or agricultural concerns to do their business. It was only in the late 1800s that this country standardized times. It had to do with the schedules of the American Railroad. Before that, you may not have known this, I didn't, it was kind of a revelation for me, every community had its own time. There was no standard time, but they had the railroads, and when they built the railroads, they wanted them to go across the country, and they needed some consistency in moving the trains. We laugh about CPT, which in our tradition is colored people's time, that's what we used to talk about down south, but actually it has historical precedence because communities had set times based on their needs. There was no national time. God's notion of time is different from ours. You see, God created time. He was outside, is outside of time, but he spoke time into being. God said, let there be light. He saw the light was good. He separated the light from the darkness. That's time. He called the light day and the darkness night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. Scientists will explain that we have seasons because of the way the earth tilted, um, moves around the sun. But as far as I know, that's true. But science is not enough. It'll tell you what. It'll even tell you how, but science doesn't tell you why. If you look at the season through God's perspective, you can learn so much more. You see, God is the original poet, the original musician. 
Uh, there is rhythm in God's economy. There is day and night. There is rest and work. There is ebb and flow. There are seasons, patterns. Summer is considered a productive time when you can see the fruits and activity of, of nature. You can relax and play because summer is fulfilling. We all love summer, but it never lasts. Autumn is a season when the leaves begin to fall and the trees and the branches become bare. It brings things to completion. We often use this season to organize and store things and there might be a need to tear some things down and let go of some things. Winter, this winter has been particularly rough and the snow has kept us from getting around and we have learned the hard way that winter is a time of stillness and isolation. You may not be able to see how God is working around you because it's usually beneath the surface. It's like seeds. You know, if you a gardener, if you grew up on a farm, you know that in the winter the seeds seem to be dormant, meaning there's no activity. But in fact, the seeds are germinating. They're developing underneath the surface. So the winter is a still time on the surface but God is working where you can't see. Spring is my favorite season. It can be tricky in this part of the country because the weather can fool you, you don't know what's going on, but, but even in the coldest day and the windiest day, there's always something new popping up with spring. It's a time of restoration, renewal, resurrection, when dead things come to life. Every season has spiritual significance. That is the purpose to everything because God has a plan. God seasons, and this, you know, I, was, I read C.S. Lewis, who is a wonderful uh, Christian apologist and writes all kinds of stories, and he wrote this story called Screwtape's Letters, and it's about how the devil writes to one of his uh, workers on what God is doing. And, and the devil says, well, God is, is doing this balanced thing between night and day and good and bad. That's how he holds on to people because God, you see, is eternal. He set eternity into our hearts. But there has to be balance because if you just stood in spring all the time, get a little boring. So God gives you rhythm to give you change, you see. Change is necessary as we move toward eternity. And I thought, what a beautiful way to look at it. We are all eternal, but God gives us change just for our pleasure so we can move toward eternity. The Bible says to everything there is a season, a time for everything under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to search, a time to give up. As God's people, we want to be aligned with God's seasons. If we are aligned with God's seasons, then we become more aware of God's rhythm, you see. We want to be synchronized on God's time. And there's a way to live in the rhythm of God's time. That's how God made us. So that aligned with God, we understand seasons. We need to understand seasons because God moves things in God's time. The problem is, most of us think we control time. We try to speed it up. We try to slow it down. We try to make up time. We try to catch up time. Every once in a while, we try to stop time. You know, as I grow older and I look in the mirror and I see, you know, your body starts going south as you grow older. <laughs> I don't know if y'all noticed that, but I start to see my chin is just going down a little bit. And I think, well, maybe I can do a little something, something, because I see on TV all the, you know, the movie stars always doing a little something, something. And I start thinking, well, I can stop time, because I can raise my chin. Now, let me tell you what God will do for you. If you ever start thinking about that, all you need to do is go on the website, and it's called Plastic Surgery Gone Wrong. <laughs> That's all I have to do. And I go on that website and I say, you know, I, don't, I think I'm going to leave my lips and tucks to God. Because you don't never know who you're going to get and it might go wrong. So I've decided to let go and deal with God's timing. Because the Bible tells me that God's timing is perfect. God does the lips and tucks. God will move you where God. Now, we should exercise, we should eat right, we should do everything we can to stay on top of it, 
but understand what is under our control and what is not. These seasons, though, are not just about how we age. It's not just about growing old. Seasons are totally in God's control. We don't all go through the same seasons at the same time. But what you can be totally certain of is if you are aligned with God, there is a reason for the season that you're in. There are periods in our lives when God wants to stretch our faith. That's a season. There are times when God wants to expand our hearts. Roxbury Presbyterian Church is going through, I believe, a growth period, but not the outside growth. It's an inside growth, like, like the seed that's being germinated that you can't see. And you, you say, well, is God doing anything? I'm telling you, God is working in this church Amen. underneath. And eventually, when God is ready, God's going to bring them in. And it's going to be packed up in here. And I've never, I've only said, I hate to say stuff like that, because then they'd be wasting. Remember, you said it, well, it didn't happen. I truly believe in my spirit that God is preparing us for something greater. There are times when God is telling us to be still and listen. We need to know what seasons we are in. And, and most of the seasons that we go through, will involve waiting. They will involve waiting. I'm going through a season of waiting right now to hear a word about a proposal that I put out there. Went out to California, haven't heard anything. I don't know what's going on. We are waiting on funding for our trauma work. We have put our word to lots of people and, and we have to wait and see. It doesn't mean it's not gonna happen. It happens on God's time. There are people right now, relatives of ours, friends of ours in the hospital right now waiting to hear their prognosis. You gotta wait on God. There is divine purpose in waiting. There is spiritual growth in waiting. God makes us wait because it can transform our character. That's what the song says. Changes our mind. Waiting can reveal our own motives. Sometimes when you're waiting, you make sure what you're waiting for and why you're waiting for it. And waiting, and I think this is the most important thing, waiting teaches us patience. Patience is crucial to our spiritual growth. The Bible tells you a lot about patience. Patience is how you learn about God's timing. First Peter says, to the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. And then it goes on to say, God is not slow, God is patient, because God doesn't want anyone to perish. So God is patient with us. We have no idea how this is all going to play out, how it's going to work out. And then the Bible tells us to model our lives on God's patience. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. If we hope for what we do not see, wait for it with patience. Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. And that brings me, all that talk about season, brings me to Paul's theory of time. The Apostle Paul knew a thing or two about timing. And that's what this scripture is about. See, I don't think we look at it like that. But this scripture tells us how to live through God's seasons. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of contentment in any and every situation, in any and every season, whether well-fed or hungry, whether I have plenty or am in want, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is a text about seasons. Now we get confused. You know, Nick sent this to me. He put it, this scripture, in his Facebook, on his Facebook page. And I was, first of all, I was so thankful to God that my child knew where the scripture was, <laughs> that he actually opened a Bible. But he put it on his Facebook page, and he was saying it as, as a reference to all the good things that are happening in his life now. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because Nick's life right now is going pretty good. He's been working. I haven't paid the rent in two years. He really, he's really got much to celebrate. But I told him, I said, Nick, remember the black musical Porgy and Bess? That was back in the 30s. And I hope you've heard there's a song out of that musical, Summertime. Summertime and the living is easy. Fish are jumping and the cotton is high. Your, your dad is rich and your mama's good looking, so hush, little baby, don't you cry. You have nothing to worry about when the living is easy. But see, that's not what Paul is talking about. 
That's what we think content is. Content is that the living is always going to be easy. But Nick, Paul is trying to warn you here that things are going to change. There are seasons in life. There will be summers in your life when everything is just clicking fine. You're productive. Blessings are flowing. Then there'll be that autumn time, Nick, when productivity starts to fade and you'll have to let go of some things and it'll be a bittersweet time. And there may be a season ahead, baby, when you have nothing, when you have nothing but isolation and stillness. You need to know how to be aligned with God through all of that through all of that. You need to know how to, how, to, how to do what Paul says. And Paul says, this process of contentment is something that you learn. Doesn't just come easy. Doesn't come easy. You have to learn to be content. There's a secret to it. And Paul says, I have learned the secret of contentment in any and every situation. Whether I'm uh, well fed or hungry, whether I have plenty or nothing, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Contentment, let me tell you what it's not as we flesh out this word. Contentment is not a matter of when thinking. You know, sometimes we say, well, I'm going to be content when I get a job. I'll be content when I retire. I'll be content when I move, when I get the house paid off, when I find a new husband, when I get this husband, whatever. That doesn't work. Because once you get something, you're going to want something else. So that's not contentment. They, the story goes that they asked billionaire Howard Hughes, how much money, Mr. Hughes, does it take to make a person happy? And Mr. Hughes said, just a little more. <laughs> a little bit more than what I got. Contentment is not about when, when I get something more. Contentment is not a lack of ambition, though. It doesn't mean you're just supposed to lay there and not do anything. It's not settling. It doesn't mean you don't want change. Contentment doesn't mean you give up your aspirations or dreams. It means you're willing to let who God take to help. Contentment means that you don't worry about what's going on. You just focus on God. God will bring the increase. God will bring the change. And, and then there's no need for anxiety. See, we put it all on us. Now, it doesn't mean we don't do anything. Certainly, there are things you need to do, but you're not doing them anxiously. You're not doing it because it's all on you. You are doing them resting in God. Amen. And the peace of God, which defies understanding, will be yours in Christ Jesus. You see, prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God, and the peace of God will be yours. And God will tell you what you can change and what you can't. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of contentment. The Amplified Bible defines being content as satisfied to the point where you are not disturbed or disquieted by anything. Nothing's going to bother you. You are content, not in your situation. You are content in your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That is the contentment we are talking about. So no matter what season you are in, you, you're blooming in that season. I visit hospitals a lot, and when I first started here at RPC, I was introduced to a young woman. I think I've told you about her before, but she stays with me. Her name was Claire. Claire was about 50 years old. She was a friend of Marcia's, a friend of a friend of mine, and Marcia introduced me to her. She was suffering when I met her from terminal cancer, living in Quincy. She'd been hospitalized for a long time, and not only was she suffering from terminal cancer, but she was in a lot of pain. And my friend Marcia said, why don't you come go with me to visit her at the hospital? And I thought I was going to visit Claire to minister to her. But I gotta tell you, when I got to see Claire, she ministered to me. She was so far beyond her circumstances that you forgot she was dying. People were coming to see Claire from all over because Claire had learned, come on now, I had learned to be content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And she had a peace. She said, you know what? I have come to a peace that if my death glorifies God, then I'm all right. And people were flocking in her room. You couldn't even get in her room to see her because
because she inspired and lifted you, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Being content means my joy is totally connected to God. Claire had mastered the art of contentment, and I just want you to do that too. I want to do that. I'm working on that. I want to refuse to give in to my circumstances. I don't want to give in to feelings. You know, if you, if you, if you, you get into trouble when you get into feelings, because you say, well, I just don't feel well today, so I'm not going to be content, or I don't feel like doing it. I don't feel like God's presence. Trust God's word and his power. And that will give you peace. Let your life Don't let your gifts just tangle in the dirt. No. Yeah. Use what you got to edify the church.